There is a quote by Wade Davis on the wall of Art Trek that I like to read again when I am over there. The world in which you were born is just one model of reality. Other cultures are not failed attempts at being you. They are unique manifestations of the human spirit. Ethnocentrism, the assumption that your own culture's ways of thinking and doing are naturally the only right way. It is one thing to understand this concept intellectually. It's quite another to get inside your own acculturated self and dissect it. William Bradford wrote a history of Plymouth Plantation from which we derive our national Thanksgiving myth. My ancestors and Bradford were neighbors, fellow colonists in 17th century Plymouth. In his book, he wrote that when the Protestant separatists considered their move across the ocean, they decided on some of those, quote, vast and unpeopled countries of America, which are fruitful and fit for habitation, being devoid of all civil inhabitants, where there are only savage and brutish men which range up and down, little otherwise than the wild beasts of the same. Note the inability to see people of this land as persons, let alone the plant and animal persons. Our European forebears came with the certitude of true believers and impressed their ideas of property, morals, and religion upon the land like a searing, hot branding iron. Robin Wall Kimmerer in Braiding Sweetgrass says that the Western tradition, in the Western tradition, there is a recognized hierarchy of beings with, of course, human being on top, the pinnacle of evolution and the plants at the bottom. But in native ways of knowing, human people are often referred to as the younger brothers of creation. She says, the reason our ancestors held so tightly to these teachings was that the worldview the settlers tried to obliterate would be one day needed by all beings here at the time of the seventh fire, in the age of the sixth extinction, of climate chaos, disconnection and dishonor, she says, I think that time is now. How do you think about ancestry? How far back do you go? Is it only the genealogy you can trace with person and place names? Is it only the human beings? of your own species? In the popular way of thinking, Kimmerer writes, history draws a time line, as if time marched in lockstep in only one direction. Some people say that time is a river into which we can step at once as it flows in a straight path to the sea. But the Anishabi people know that time is a circle Time is not a river running inexorably to the sea, but the sea itself, its tides that appear and disappear, the fog that rises to become rain is a different river. All things that once were will be again. I want to tell you about a dream that I had 14 years ago that relates to my place in the circle. It was the time I had my first two grandchildren, born three months apart. But first, I need to set the scene for you. The dream opens in the cul-de-sac, where my parents lived on one side of the street, and Debbie and our three kids lived on the other side, homes that we each built, raised about 15, 20 feet above the street. But first, I need to set the scene a little further back. <clears throat> I was raised a Pentecostal preacher's son, the youngest of five boys. Mom was nurturing, affectionate, outwardly expressive, and loving. 
She breastfed me on music. Dad was introspective, serious, reserved, smart, with a dry sense of humor and a deep baritone laugh that would explode unexpectedly while reading a book or watching television. He grew up poor in a family with 11 children that prayed literally for their daily bread. His preacher father moved the family from town to town in the Canadian and the North Midwest prairie looking for a steady gig. Things only got worse when the Great Depression hit. As a consequence, Dad attended 15 schools, including three high schools. Rootlessness became a perennial state of mind his whole life. When my father's father was seven years old, and sometimes I find it helpful to look at my forebears, my parents, and those before as the children that they were. It helps me with my empathy. So when my grandfather was seven years old, he wrote this pledge on a scrap of paper, a copy of which I have. I am seven years old, and this is the last day of October 1888. I promise my mama that I will never chew, nor smoke, nor touch strong drink any stronger than tea nor coffee. George A. Snyder, Addison, Ontario. Later that year, he wrote another note. I was converted to God, and I gave my heart to him on February the 21st. I was seven years old, and I am determined to go on and never chew, nor smoke, nor drink, <laughs> nor drink whiskey, nor tell lies, nor swear. S-W-A-R-E. Never in my life. That's a lot of commitment for a seven-year-old <laughs> to bear. This, however, is one of the places I come from. My dad loved words. He was also a man who loved working with his hands, and he built several houses and two churches, homes that we lived in. That's how I learned to build houses, by helping him build one right here in Lynn Ranch, not far away in 1980. I was on a leave of absence from my graduate program in religion and social ethics at USC. My worldview was then in a state of reconstruction, mostly still in the demolition phase. <laughs> Building an actual home seemed like a good way to occupy my limbs and my brain cells as I mentally bracketed the big questions. The next year, Debbie and I built our first house in Thousand Oaks. I went back to grad school, finished coursework and my qualifying exams, and started a dissertation on Kurt Vonnegut. While outdoors, using my body to create, I felt like Joy Harjo in her description. Joy was taken to an evangelical church in Oklahoma when she was a child, but it was when she was outside alone in the early mornings that she learned to think spiritually. The trees, the earth, the sky, all the insects and creatures shined exactly who they were. They did not have to concern themselves with burning in hell. They just were, and in their world. I felt a kind of peace that was nowhere else, not in the house, nor in church. I knew who I was there in that world, peopled by elements, plants, and animals. And I was not afraid. After four years, I got a call from Dad. He was building another house, this one in Newberry Park on the cul-de-sac, with a clear view of Mount Boney. There was a vacant lot for sale across the street, he said. It was, this was starting to get habit forming. So I helped Dad build his house, and Debbie and I started ours across the street. One day, I think I can tell you this one by memory, I came over to the house and I greeted the carpenters that Dad had hired to form his foundation. How's it going, I said. And one of them frowned and said, I don't like the nails your, get, your dad gave us to use. And he pointed at a box on the, floor, on the ground. And I looked at it 
and there were drywall nails, sheet metal nails, uh, roofing nails, framing nails, some of them rusty. And I quickly gathered the picture that this box of random nails was telling. Dad had been going out after hours to other construction sites and collecting the abandoned nails and whatnot that workers had left as so much trash. My father, a child of the Depression, never let anything to waste. And I, I smiled at that story, even as I had empathy for the, the carpenters. It reminded me of the native honorable harvest that Robin Wall Kimmerer talks about in Sweetgrass, such parts as take only what you need and use it respectfully, never waste what you have taken. In my own life, while many pieces of my theological jigsaw puzzle remain scattered about in the corners of my brain, I was less worried about them. But I was sure by then, to quote Joey Harjo again, there is no one way to God, no one correct spiritual path, no one way to write poetry, and there's no one roadway, no one way bearing straight, no one kind of flowering plant, no one kind of tiger, no one way of knowledge. Diversity characterizes this planet, this galaxy, this universe. Christian mystics tell us that silence is the language of God. All else is poor translation. I think of the poetry of Rumi. Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Ideas, language, even the phrase each other doesn't make any sense. For my father and I, there was an unspoken truth as we built together. Out beyond all theology, creeds, and dogma, there is a building site. <laughs> I'll meet you there. <laughs> we did not always need words to communicate our love for one another. <clears throat> Within a year, he would get pancreatic cancer, and after that, a rapid and painful decline and die at home. I was honored to be with both of my parents in their final days as they passed at home. They were both teachers in death as they were in life. They taught us how to die with dignity and strength of soul. And the sense of their presence is never far. Several years ago, my brother told me a story about our father, and I, I'd never heard it before. But in the last year of life, when he was in his mid-60s, he said, at this stage of my life, I'm not going to judge anymore. I'm only going to love. If God wants to raise up a prophet, he can do that. But as for me, I'm only going to love. I never heard that story before, but I felt it. And I told the story to my grown kids, and what my father had said about not judging anymore and only loving. And my middle child, my son, said, yeah, get there sooner. the sooner you and I can get there to that place of non-judgment, non-judgmental love, the better ancestors we will be. The gift will be felt for generations. And I pause to remember a song from Sunday school that I was taught. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. I knew you were out there. <laughs> what does loving all the children look like? 
In the sixth grade, late in the year, there was a new boy enrolled in my class. His name was Richard. He was rambunctious, to say the least, borderline out of control with his overly aggressive physical play. Today, I'm sure he'd be diagnosed as hyperactive, at least. I was so impressed with him, I went to church and mentioned it to one of my friends. And I told him about him, and I told him his name, and the kid said, well, I know him. He was kicked out of our school. Well, on the way home from church, I told this juicy gossip to my parents. Said I was going to tell everyone at school. Dad said, you most certainly will not. That boy is there at your school to have a second chance. and You are going to let him have it. I was disappointed, but I did as he said. And a week later, my nemesis, Roger, found out and told everyone anyway. And I was disappointed again to be scooped. <laughs> but over the years, as I remember this incident, I, I understood that for my father, the gospel was about redemption. It was about second chances. It was about love. I remember reading in the Bible my parents gave me about a place Jesus called the kingdom of God. Not far off in heaven, but here, where the hungry are fed, the sick are healed, the poor are clothed, the peacemakers are blessed. It's a place where if you have two coats and your neighbor has none, you give them one of yours. It's a place where the outsider is welcomed, where love is the law of the land. How far have the people who go by his name have traveled from that kingdom? So in my dream that I was going to tell you about, remember, I'm on the street of my house in my parents' house. My father has been dead for 23 years. Mom has been dead for nearly eight. Our first two grandchildren are a few months old. We have not lived on that street in decades. Now there at the base of mom and dad's mailbox, I'm startled to find two dolls leaned up against the mailbox post. I'm alarmed there alone and exposed to the elements, and I quickly gather them up <clears throat> in my arms, and I walk up the concrete driveway to my house. I go into the garage and I head for the door that leads into the house, which is wide open. I see my mother there inside the main room, standing, moving about in her house coat, nurturing. I feel the urge to bring her the dolls so she can care for them. But she is busying herself with one thing or another and doesn't even notice that I'm there. So I turn to a cabinet to my left and put the dolls inside, safe. When I woke up, I understood the meaning of the dream. Home, four generations, and the responsibility is yours now. You are the grandparent. Soon enough, I will be an ancestor if not this decade or the next, the ones after that. My parents were good people and they made mistakes. Not everything they passed on I kept. Maybe you feel the same way about your immediate and more distant ancestry. Our culture particularly is at a crossroads in terms of reaping the harvest of gross materialism and consumption. We must change course change the ways we consume, the way we consume energy, the way we produce food, and more. Above all, we need to reassess our spiritual connection to the earth and all being. Here's a Taoist affirmation that resonates with me. May I cultivate harmony in my relationships and my environment. For those of us deeply entwined with the colonial past, 
it is incumbent upon us to take responsibility for all the ancestors passed on, both helpful and harmful, and cultivate harmony in our relationships and our environment. When the colonists first came to the Northeast, they saw native women and men planting three crops together on one foot diameter round mounds, corn, beans, squash, thank you. I know lots of you are with me on this one too. This is known as the Three Sisters Garden. The colonists thought the natives didn't know what the heck they were doing because they were used to planting a single crop in rows. But the natives knew. A Three Sisters Garden is a form of what is known as companion planting where the plants are planted next to each other, sharing their unique characteristics for mutual benefit. All three plants work in harmony to support each other. Corn is planted first. It grows fast, strong, and tall, and forms a structure for the beans, which grow up and wrap themselves around the corn stalk and use it for support. The beans give back to the corn and squash by providing much-needed nitrogen, in the form of nodules produced at the root. The broad leaves of the squash help prevent the ground from drying up and repel insects with their spiny leaves and vines. The way of the three sisters, write, ro writes Robin Wall Kimmerer, reminds me of one of those basic teachings of our people. The most important thing each of us can know is our unique gift and how to use it in the world. What's your unique gift? I wonder what else we might have missed when we came across the ocean. At age nine, Kimmer's Potawatomi, Potawatomi grandfather was sent to the Carlisle Indial Indian Industrial School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania founded in 1879 by Lieutenant Henry Pratt, whose brilliant motto was, kill the Indian, save the man. The school became the model for hundreds of others intent on civilizing native children, forbidding residents from speaking their language and effectively erasing their native culture. Children like Kimmer's grandfather had their mouths washed out with soap or worse for, quote, talking the dirty Indian language. Knowing the importance of language to culture, Kimmerer set out to learn the Potawatomi, <laughs> Potawatomi language. Thank you. There were but nine living fluent speakers remaining. She found the language very difficult. In English, most of the words are nouns. About 30% are verbs, when, but in her language, 70% are verbs, such as to be a rock, to be a hill, to be a Saturday, to be red. How can these be verbs, she thought, when they are clearly things? She became so frustrated, she nearly quit, ready to concede defeat to the missionaries and the government. <clears throat> but then she read the verb to be a bay, and something clicked. She could smell the water of the bay, watch it rock against the shore, and hear it sift into the sand. A bay is only a noun if water is dead. To be a bay, I'm going to try to say it, weak wigama, releases it from bondage and lets it live. This is the grammar of animacy. In the universe, it becomes a communion of subjects, not a collection of objects. This has consequences for our behavior. When the earth is alive and family, you no longer treat it as object. We're going to close the service in a little bit with part of a, an address called the Thanksgiving Address of the Iroquois or Haudenosaunee 
tribe. They've published it in over 40 languages. Because she is not a member of the nation, Robin Kimmerer said, asked respectfully if she could, if it would be okay for her to write about the Thanksgiving address and what it meant to her. She was told, of course you should write about it. It's supposed to be shared. We've been waiting 500 years for people to listen. If they'd understood the Thanksgiving then, we wouldn't be in this mess. All these years after Columbus, Kimmer writes, some of the wisest native elders still puzzle over the people who came to our shores. They look at the toll on the land and say, the problem with these people, these new people, is that they, they don't have both feet on the shore. One is still on the boat. They don't seem to know whether they're staying or not. Some contemporary scholars see in our social pathologies and relentlessly materialist culture the fruit of such homelessness, a rootless past. For the sake of the peoples and the land, can we set aside the ways of the colonists and become indigenous to place? Can we, as a nation of immigrants, learn to live here as if we were staying with both feet on the shore? Immigrants cannot by definition, be indigenous. Indigenous is a birthright word. But we can become naturalized to place, throw off the mindset of the immigrant. To become naturalized is to know your ancestors lie in this ground. To become naturalized is to live as if your children's future matters to take care of the land as if our lives and the lives of all our relatives depend on it. Because they do.